Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our justice system, our legal system, and how they intersect with the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we are truly fortunate to have as our guest Professor Vincent Bonventry from Albany Law School. Professor Bonventry has been serving Albany Law School as a professor since 1990, teaching a variety of courses in, in so many different areas, including criminal law, criminal procedure, courses about our court system, and also judicial decision making. And welcome, Professor, and thank you for being here today. This is a treat to be here. Well, I'm thrilled because so many of the things that you're working on and so many subjects that you speak on on a daily basis are very involved in our mainstream media today as we speak, including issues involving our New York State Court of Appeals. And you've done so much work on uh, involving uh, uh, yourself with our Court of Appeals and our court system in general. And of course, a lot of that uh, is not only uh, flows from your 23 years of service as a professor at Albany Law School, but also your service as a clerk, as a law clerk in our mm -hmm. Court of Appeals for judge, Judges Jason and Hancock before you even came to Albany Law School. Right. And I'm also uh, very interested in your clerkship in the United States Supreme Court as well. Sadly, of course, 30 minutes could never do justice to your service oh, here on. <laughs> on, behalf of, uh, on behalf of the legal system. But I'm very I've been lucky. I've been very lucky to do lots of really fun things. Well, you know, so many of us are already engaged in watching your uh, and, and, and checking in on your blog, uh, New York Court Watcher. Right. And you've been very active lately, too, speaking about the recent uh, filling of the vacancy filling on our New York State. Right. Court Wasn't that fascinating? Here. It was really fascinating. It's, you know, for court geeks like me, it's always interesting. You know, when there's a vacancy on the court, and then to see what the process produces and who the governor ends up choosing, and uh, then how this new judge turns out on the court. This one was particularly fascinating, not only because it was Andrew Cuomo's first pick on the court, um, but because the, the individual that he picked was so very different than anybody else who has ever been picked since the Court of Appeals went to the appointment system in 1977. You know, no judicial experience, which is okay, but also not really much private practice experience, um, really not much any kind of conventional or traditional legal experience. She's an academic, and not only is she an academic, she's not even a particularly conventional or traditional academic. If you look at the kinds of scholarship that she's produced, if you look at most of the courses that she teaches, uh, they're what you would call critical race theory, critical feminist theory, things about uh, paradigmatic challenges to subclassifications of discrimination law, things like this that you don't usually see in nominees to the New York Court of Appeals. So, very interesting. Well, and there's another vacancy yet to be filled in, in connection with the Court of Appeals. Vin, let's give a brief overview of the state court system right. and then and, and, and ultimately how our highest court in the state, the Court of Appeals, what they do uh, ultimately and why it's so important uh, as to uh, who's on that Court of Appeals. What, how is the state court system um, comprised? Well, as you know even better than I, I mean, at, at the trial level, we have several different uh, kinds of trial courts. courts. Your justice court, we have county courts, uh, downstate we have district courts. Right. Uh, ultimately, what happens is you have the highest trial court, which we call Supreme Court. Virtually every other jurisdiction in the country uses the term Supreme Court to mean their highest court. 
We use it to mean our highest trial court, which of course confuses the heck out of sure. New Yorkers and everybody else, but <laughs> so be it. So we have the, the Supreme Court, which is our highest trial court. Then we have our intermediate appellate court. That's the appellate division. And we actually have, we call it four departments. In short, we have four of them. We've got one in Rochester, one in Albany, one in Brooklyn, one in Manhattan. And then we've got the New York Court of Appeals which is the final word for New York law, the final word for rights and liberties in New York State. And when we talk about Jenny Rivera and the nomination of her to the Court of Appeals, we are talking about one of seven members of the Court of Appeals that is going to decide the fundamental policies and fundamental rights and liberties for New Yorkers. So it's extremely important. Yes, it is. And I uh, was just at a, a dinner with uh, Judge Lippman, who's the chief right. judge. That's right. And uh, he. Interesting, too. We call them judges and not justices. Yes. That's Everybody right. else calls their high court judges justices, right? We call them judges. And guess what we call our. Our, our town judges. Well, you're a justice. I'm a justice. Good That's for right. you. <laughs> That's right, because we know where justice is actually <laughs> provided. Yeah. Well, that is yeah. true. Yeah, and on a daily basis. That's right. You provide more justice than anybody else, any court in the entire system. Most people in New York State, and really in any other state in America, when they think about courts, they're thinking about you. Their experience with the courts is experience with you. That's what really law is to 99% of the people, 99% of the time. Well, and our country uh, has been uh, fashioned uh, that way since its, its inception. I know when Alexis de Tocqueville came here uh, yep. to do a study on American democracy uh, in the early 1800s, he noted uh, that, this, uh, that, that the local justice of right. the peace system represented the essence of Absolutely. democracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're elected. I mean, you've got to go before the people and the people get to choose you. They get to choose whether or not they want you meeting out justice. That's not the way it is with the Court of Appeals judges. Not any longer. Not any longer. Since 1977, uh, the Court of Appeals judges are selected by the so-called merit system. It's supposedly, you know, a non-political merit system. Uh, you know, any candid observer knows that we didn't take the politics out of it. All we did was restrict the politics to um, a fewer uh, group of players. And by and large, that's the members of this nominating commission. And then the governor who selects from the list that's produced by the nominating commission. And then if the Senate ever does its work, then the Senate is involved. But usually the Senate doesn't do much with regard to these nominations. So we have this new so-called uh, merit appointment system for the Court of Appeals. But prior to 1977, it was by election. The, the judges for the Court of Appeals, our highest judges, had to go out like you do. They had to go out, they had to meet the voters, and they had to persuade the voters that they ought to be elected to the highest court. Do you believe that makes the best judge, an elected judge? You know, to tell you the truth, I think that studying the Court of Appeals, it really was a more prestigious court. It was a better court in the years when the judges were elected. That doesn't necessarily mean that the election system is a better system. I think what it means is, no matter right. what the system is, whether it's uh, the political bosses choosing who's going to run for a seat on the Court of Appeals, or whether it's the governor choosing who he's going to appoint to the Court of Appeals. If you have the selector caring about a great Court of Appeals, you're going to get great judges. If you have the political bosses not caring whether it's a great court or not, not caring whether who they nominate is a great judge, or if you have the governor now not caring that much about having a great Court of Appeals, you're not going to get a great court. And we've kind of had that. And that's one of the problems. Do you see it evolving uh, at, at, at positively uh, in more recent times as far as a, a national forum? When I was at Albany Law School, we were taught that, yeah. the, uh, that our Court of Appeals in the state of New York was the preeminent state yeah. court in the entire country and that decisions that were rendered there had broad impact throughout uh, state courts uh, and throughout the country. And, um, and you've pointed out that, that there might have been a lapse in the late 70s and 80s right. as, as to its, how, it was, how it distinguished itself. Do you see it moving in a different direction today? Well, 
I do, and I think in large measure that is because um, the Chief Judge Lippman um, has a very different approach to leading the court. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a better judge than Chief Judge Kay was, but his idea of how the appellate court ought to work is very, very different, and I think it makes for a much more dynamic court. In short, uh, Judge Kay was very, very interested in unanimous decisions. She didn't like dissents. What that means is that when the Court of Appeals is deciding a case, there may be one opinion. And that may seem, at first blush, to be a good thing. Oh, the court is finally hammering something out. We only have one opinion as opposed to two different opinions. The problem, however, that I see, and Chief Judge Lippman also sees with that, is that in trying to ensure that decisions are unanimous, the writer of the opinion for the court necessarily has to fudge over the differences, necessarily has to gloss over the, the, you know, the fine print in the opinion. So afterwards, you look at this decision and you say, I'm not really sure what it stands for. If you have a dissent, right. then the majority opinion, who's ever writing for the court, has got to respond to the dissent. And the dissent is going to bring stuff up that the majority wouldn't want to bring up. So you have a exactly. much, much clearer decision. And so with Judge Lippman not only allowing dissents, but seemingly encouraging them, I think you have much bolder, much more dynamic decisions coming out of the Court I of Appeals. I see that. E exactly. I think that uh, sometimes in, in an effort to gain consensus, you mute the difference. Right. And that's exactly, I think, what was going on. And you know, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, the difference. The, um, there were years in the K-Court, there were years in the K-Court where you would have ten, only 10 divided cases the entire year. In other words, 10 cases where there would be a dissent. Some years 15, some years 20. Now what you have is more than double that, almost triple that now, almost triple that. So. I think the last year there was 70. There were 70 cases where there is a divided court. I mean, that's enormous. That's a complete change in dynamics at the Court of Appeals. Well, that's a very interesting uh, uh, note for all of us there. And of course, recently uh, in the filling of, of, the, uh, of one of the two vacancies yeah. on the Court of Appeals uh, with now Judge Rivera, yeah. uh, you've spoken uh, on your um, New York Court Watcher uh, blog on, on a variety of issues that were being considered at the time. And I just wondered whether you uh, ultimately thought that, the, um, that the, the process was working or whether there was not enough review or, 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 or whether or what you expect to in the filling of the other vacancy yeah. prospectively. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question and an important one because in the past with this uh, new appointment system, you know, the Senate is supposed to exercise advice and consent. But the Senate's participation in our appointment system has been an absolute joke. It has been absolutely worthless. And I'm sure if you spoke candidly with the senators, they would all say that that is true. That changed this time. That changed this time. Uh, Senator John Bonasek, who's now the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, made it clear pretty early on that he was going to change things, that the Senate was now going to be serious in taking part, taking its constitutional part in the appointment process. So with Jenny Rivera, we actually had Senate confirmation hearings. There actually were tough questions that you want the senators to hear. They want the senators to ask. Uh, answers you want them to hear before they make a decision, before it was a joke. They would bring the nominee in, you know, who, you know, the nominee the governor, everybody knew wanted, would show up on the list that the nominating commission would produce. The governor would nominate this person, and then the Judiciary Committee would have witnesses to tell everybody how wonderful this nominee is. Oh, your mom's here. She's wonderful. Your dad's here. Wonderful. <laughs> Your significant other, wonderful. We think you're wonderful. And then they get this unanimous or near unanimous vote. It really was a joke just like that. For example, you know, with uh, Chief Judge Littman, 
at the Senate Judiciary hearings for him, do you know who testified? Two of the judges of the Court of Appeals who would be working under him. How are you, what do you expect them to say? No, he's going to be rotten on the Court of Appeals. He's going to be my chief, but he's rotten. This time what happened was that uh, Senator John Bonasek, Senator John DeFrancisco, actually grilled the candidate. They weren't nasty. It wasn't like you see with the United States Senate and United States Supreme Court nominees. It wasn't like that. I mean, they were really piercing questions, important substantive questions. I have to say, I was really proud of them. I thought they did a great job. You did. So do you think that uh, Judge Rivera actually was put under more of a microscope than many of her predecessors? More than any of them. More than any of more them. More right. than any of them. The right. only other one, the only other one that took some heat uh, was uh, Carmen Saparic. Actually, the, uh, the first Hispanic on the court that Jenny Rivera, Correct. another Hispanic woman, right, right. is replacing. Uh, judge Saparic came under a lot of heat because when she was a trial judge, she had the gall to decide that the New York State Constitution protected a woman's right to choose. And a lot of the Republican senators weren't too crazy about that. So there were actually 25 votes against her. But okay. it was primarily because of that. Right. There wasn't the, there wasn't the real serious questioning like Rivera got. Mm. Well, we have another vacancy now, uh, right. currently. Uh, and uh, what, what, what are you uh, uh, seeing there? And how do you see that selection process? Yeah. And does the governor have to choose from the list that was created yeah. with, with Judge Rivera's name on it? Or does a new list get created? There will be a new list. All there right. will be a new list. Now, the nominating commission has made it clear to all the people who have applied who did apply for the position that Jenny Rivera just filled. They've made it clear, if you want your application to be reconsidered for the new vacancy, we will do so. But the Judicial Nominating Commission will produce a brand new list of seven. And yes, the governor must choose from that list. There have been governors that have not been terribly happy with the list. Uh, with the lists, but uh, they are forced, uh, they are required to choose from that list. So what will happen is, almost assuredly, because um, Theodore Jones, who tragically passed away, he was the only African American on the court. Uh, you can put money on it, there will be African Americans on that list, on that seven list, and the governor almost assuredly will appoint an African American. You know, there was a Hispanic woman. She retired. A Hispanic woman was nominated to replace her. The only African American on the court, there will be an African American almost assuredly uh, to replace him. Any projections yet on, uh, the, well, the list hasn't been assembled yet, is that right. correct? Okay. But there was, there was an African American woman on the list um, for the seat that Jenny Rivera just filled. Um, that was, uh, Justice Abdul Salam, an appellate division justice. She's from the second of the first department, All I'm right. not sure. She's got a very, very good reputation. I would fully expect that she's going to be on this next list as well. And I think she's got a good shot. So your, your position uh, as a, a court watcher too is it doesn't necessarily have to be a male who is appointed to the next vacancy. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, right. No, we've lost that on that. Yeah. It's not. It's not right. a requirement that if a man uh, a man retires, right. he must be replaced by a man. But right. um, mm -hmm. well, because we've been staffing the court of appeals for most of its history, most of the time, there were just men. That's right. There were just guys. This That's was a right. guys' club, yeah. right? Not until uh, Mario Cuomo appointed Judith Kay to the court, right, right. in 1983. That was the first time there was a woman on the New York Court of Appeals. You know, I work with her now, and I'm very lucky to be able to have that opportunity. She is, um, uh, she uh, co-chairs a New York State Bar Association right. Committee on Youth Courts, yeah. and I am on that committee with her, and I've been down to her, um, her office in New York City where yeah. she hosts the meetings, and she has been absolutely 
uh, delightful, and we lobbied together last yeah. year uh, trying to get a youth court bill passed with the yeah. state legislature, and uh, we walked uh, and uh, went door to door, and it was a great experience for me just being a yeah. just a town judge oh, in upstate an, New York. She's an icon, right? She, I think so. And yeah. she's she's an extraordinary. You cannot get anybody more dedicated, more <clears throat> devoted to public service, more ethical than Judith K. Yeah. I was at the for seven years that I was at the Court of Appeals clerking. She was there, so I got to work with her. She's she's an extraordinary woman. Yeah, and I and uh, she's been very nice to take this whole project under her wing, right? And her and and put her imprimatur on, on the right. process. Oh yeah, here. it's it's been great, and it's been a fabulous experience for me too, and, and being able to have that chance to work with her in this, uh, merely because she's not serving as chief judge of our That's Court right. of Appeals due to mandatory retirement does not mean she's retired. That's right. In any way. Yeah. She's, you know, for she's kind of like um, she's kind of like the Sandra Day O'Connor for New York State. I mean, Sandra Day right. O'Connor as well is an icon for the country. But you know, when Judith Kay was the chief judge of New York, she was one of the hottest judicial commodities in the country. Everybody knew this woman. Everybody right. knew this woman was brilliant. Everybody knew this woman was a scholar. Everybody knew this woman wrote great opinions. She was, yeah, she's really magnificent. Well, um, we're very lucky to have her still so much involved yes. in the process yeah. of New York state law. She's the chair of the Senate of the uh, Judicial Nominating Commission. She actually chairs the commission, this 12 member commission that produces the list that's given to the governor from which the governor must choose the Court of Appeals. Now, you spent some time, too, in, in Washington, D.C., as a clerk in our United well, States actually, Supreme Court. Well, actually, it was a, a judicial fellow. Yeah. A judicial fellow is different than a clerk. Judicial fellow, you're kind of like a resident scholar for the chief, for the chief justice. So we're a little older when we're fellows. Clerks are usually um, kids that are right out of law school, right. these brilliant kids that are right out of law school, right. and they usually have clerked for a federal court of appeals judge, and then they go to a Supreme Court justice. Um, you have to be a little older and a little grayer by the time you get to be a fellow. And they're usually people who are in the midst of an academic career or people who have already clerked for other courts, stuff like that. So yeah, so I got the opportunity to uh, be a judicial fellow for Chief Justice Berger, and that was phenomenal. Well, I, I have to believe that. I mean, Chief Justice Berger, obviously an icon himself in yes. United States law, and uh, well, uh, his his impact on the and shaping. Uh, our country's uh, legal process um, is, uh, is felt today. That's and right. uh, and uh, so how long were you down uh, working in for that a year. environment? It's for a, a year. It's a year fellowship. It's a year fellowship. Mm -hmm. And before we were, uh, before we went on the air, I was telling you this story. You know, I hate wearing ties. <laughs> Since I was a little kid, I have never mm. liked to dress up. Yeah. And I blame my mother for it somehow. <laughs> you know, and I tell her that. And she says, Vincent, your father always wore a tie. Right. I right. said, Ma, you ruined it for me. Right. I never like to wear it. But one day, I'm in my office when I'm down in DC. I'm in my office, and I get a call from the chief's chambers. And I'm told, the chief wants you to come over. So I said, OK, I'll be there in a few minutes. I got to put my suit on. I am not going to face the chief without a suit and tie. So uh, I got a call back a few minutes. No, the chief wants you here now. So I said, Mark, Mark Cannon was the fellow who was calling me up, the, the chief's chief administrative assistant. Uh, he says, uh, no, the chief really wants you now. I said, Mark, I don't have socks on. I'm wearing penny loafers. I got my khakis and a polo shirt. Right. I don't want to show up to see the chief like this. <laughs> So I hear him telling the chief, and the chief says, tell him to get over here. <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> so I walk over to the chief's chambers, and he's got this <clears throat> seminar table. And I look at this table, and everybody is wearing a black suit, white shirt, dark tie. The chief's at the head of the table. I walk in, the big jaboop, you know, mm -hmm. with no socks on. The chief looks at me. And he looks at the rest of them and he says, maybe if they dressed more comfortably like you, they'd get more work done. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gave me a look like, never let this happen Dead again. Right, right. Yeah. I'll cover you this time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
But I loved him. I, I thought he was wonderful. Well, what a special opportunity to be able to interact with him on a personal note, yeah. too. And uh, so many of us are only uh, left to read decisions uh, and not actually see uh, and interact with the person that was responsible for them. What a great experience. And of yeah. course, it's led you to be to have uh, such great uh, capacity to uh, teach courses to our Albany Law School students on judicial uh, decision making. Right. Have you seen the law? Of course, I'm a very proud uh, grad of Albany Law School, and I have a daughter Good. graduating. And we're proud this of year, you, Judge. And I'm very we're happy ready. about it, and I'm spending a tremendous amount of time there now. And you know, your daughter is my research assistant. Well, good. She does great work. Well, I'm happy. And I love to... having her in class, and I love her doing all my work. Well, that's, <laughs> that is very nice of you to uh, choose her in that way. Uh, she is a very special young lady too, and uh, and the and she's grown uh, with uh, the Albany Law School experience yeah. as well. And uh, we're doing such good work down there at the law school. Have you seen the Have you seen the uh, law school education or the process change in your 23 years of being a professor? What do you see? Yeah, abs absolutely. You know, when I first got to the school, it was very. Um, New York centric, New York law centric. That's right. Um, by that time, however, uh, law school applicants, not only from New York but around the country, were becoming much more familiar with law schools all around the country, not just the law schools in their neighborhood. So you start having these US News and War Report rankings, and people start looking at other law schools. So if you lived in the region upstate, you know, if you lived in this region, Albany Law School was the place to go. Correct. But now, all of a sudden, the students were becoming, the applicants were becoming much more cognizant of law schools all around. They didn't have to go in their backyard, right? And so we had a series of deans who wanted to make the law school more national. So it would be more attractive to applicants all around the country. Mm. Um, and one of the deans, like the last dean, we had really pushed scholarship, but national scholarship. You know, it's debatable whether that has helped Albany Law School at all. And I think that there is a move, perhaps, to bring Albany Law School um, not exactly back to where it was, but perhaps to, to tweak things a little so that Albany Law School once again becomes the best law school in this region. Why are we competing with Berkeley out in California? Why are we competing with the University of Chicago in Illinois? No, but we should right. be able to compete as the best law school in New York for applicants in this region. And our new dean, Penny Andrews, is just absolutely phenomenal, and she understands that. She has been fabulous. I've had an occasion to work with her in a variety of different settings at the law school, right. and she is just so open, she giving, great? and uh, her picture's in the terrific. newspaper today for yep. uh, speaking to some of our, some of our newly admitted uh, lawyers uh, just yesterday, I believe. And uh, very, very concerned about students. Um, I think more so than at any time I've been at Albany Law School, 23 years, uh, we have a dean whose primary focus is the students. So of the top 10 areas of focus, the top nine are students. Yeah, so I think that that's, that's a big change. Scholarship is still in there, but taking care of students is by far the most important thing. Do you see our court system? How do you see our court system in 100 years? How do, how do you, will it be shaped the same? Will it be designed the same? Will it be uh, more electronic? Uh, what, what do you see for our court system in the state of New York as we move forward? Any, any uh, striking changes that you might think? Uh, or would the Court of Appeals work just as much the way it does today? Well. Or will it, will it have a different uh, 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 MO? Well, the Court of Appeals is working just about the same way today as it was working in 1846. Okay. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect too many changes in terms of, you know, we're going to change it from seven judges mm -hmm. to 15 judges. I wouldn't expect that. But I think certainly technology, we're seeing technology already. Uh, cameras in the courtroom, emailing this, emailing that, electronic this, electronic that. Mm. And I think even beyond that, I mean, the way technology is creating these challenging questions for judges, um, 
you know, ju- challenging questions for you, challenging questions right. for judges on the New York Court of Appeals. What do you do with this stuff? You know, one of the landmark decisions of the Lippman Court was this People versus Weaver. You right. know, what do you do with GPS that's, right. that's attached to a car and the police, they monitor somebody's movements for 65 days. They don't have a warrant. They don't have probable cause. They don't even have reasonable suspicion. But, you know, somebody who knows what, he might be one of 15 black kids that you saw around a, a Kmart. So you put the GPS on his car, you monitor him for 65 days, and one of them, you know, you find out was involved in a burglary. Now, is that an unreasonable search? Well, the New York Court of Appeals says, yes, it is an unreasonable search. You want to have some justification for monitoring this guy's movements. Now, the, New York, the United States Supreme Court may see things a little differently, but you know the New York Court of Appeals is an independent court, and under New York law and New York's Constitution can protect our rights a lot more than the United States Supreme Court does, thank God, I think. And so in the GPS case, the Lippmann Court said, no, this is a search. If you're going to monitor somebody's movements, have justification and get a darn warrant. Now, it's a different story with the United States Supreme Court. We don't know whether they're going to require a warrant. They actually had a GPS case, and they said you needed a warrant in that case, but they didn't base that on the fact that the police were monitoring somebody's movements. They only based that on the fact that the GPS was a trespass on the guy's vehicle. So if you were driving, say, a rental car, it's not your car, so they put the GPS on that car. It's not a trespass on you. Right. Right. Or forget about GPS. They're monitoring you from cell phone towers. Right. Or they're monitoring you from aerial surveillance. According to the United States Supreme Court, apparently that's not a search. And therefore, no warrants required, no probable cause, no reasonable suspicion. The Court of Appeals would never put up with that nonsense. Thank God for the New York Court of Appeals. Well, and, and thank God for Professor Von Ventry well, uh, for, for being with us today. Uh, the, the electricity that you bring to the knowledge that well, you've earned you. and possessed uh, is going a long way uh, for all of us here in the town of Colony, uh, beginning to understand uh, the nature and extent of our Court of Appeals and the selection process and so many other issues that are very important to all of us yeah. today. And we thank you so much for being with us and sharing some of your um, brief time that you have available with us here in the thank town of Colony. Thank you so Colony. much, Judge. It was really fun to be with you. Good well, to be with you. Thank you very much, Finn. And we look forward to having you return uh, in the near future. We thank would look you forward so to that. Very. Will you come back in the near future? Absolutely. We would look forward to that. Thank you. I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and thank you for joining me on Benchmark. <laughs>